Hello, Storyteller, Storytelling Ron. This is a video for GMs, for Grand Ministers. I'm going to be going over uh, this campaign I'm working on and just giving you advice on how to GM a Christian role-playing game where you play as a, well, actually as a GM, the Grand Minister, you're going to be playing as pagans or and some of the church ministers, the ministers of the church, and the players are going to be playing as missionaries. And yes, you get all, oh, I want to do another video today where about... I'm actually going to do another video today or, or tomorrow, but it's about like all the other role playing games and how we all love them. We do. I love them. I love, you know, D and D and, and the, all the Gonzo stuff and the Conan, you know, and all that cool stuff. I really do, but we got to, we got to put our faith in the game and I'm showing you how we can do it. And this game is about that. It's about, I get to be a D and D and a Christian. You know, I get to do all of it. I get to do all the crazy Gonzo stuff and evangelize in the game and you know fantasize my christian faith but but the, but in fantasizing my faith uh and our faith and our fellowship and fantasizing it we're working on it we're practicing you know i feel like i got a little hair thing going on there um because you know sword practice is hitting a pell which a pell is the uh, the old practice stand for knights and you, you've got to hit that over and 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 over and, and to finally get the muscle memory, right? That's what role-playing games is too. It's all, it's about you working on your social skills over and over and over and over and over and over. It's about your, you know, a lot of you say, oh, it's just a game. It's, but it's, it helps us. It helps us in fellowship and socializing. And that's what I'm realizing. And um, you and I need to course correct um, and put our faith back into it. We have removed our faith from it, but the pagans have kept theirs in, right? They say, don't, don't bring in religion. That's not, no, no. okay. So now you have a character. What God do you want him to worship or what gods do you want to follow? Or what, you know what I mean? The game is making us be pagan and it's making our psyche be pagan. It's making us churchmen be pagan in our, we don't realize it, but it's slowly permeating into our real role at world so that we act like that as opposed to, um, doing Christian things in the game that then translate to our, the real world in our practicing. My point being, we can have a lot of fun. I'm, and I didn't know when I started this, I didn't know it was going to be fun. I was really nervous. Oh man. The first few times I've GM this, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's and just so you know, if you're a new GM, it's like, what do I do? What do I do? You know, it's, there's, it's just not in there, you know? Um, but you know how you do it? You just do it and keep making mistakes with your kids. Uh, I've had a few people t talk to me now, GMs or dads and trying with their kids and, and if I've gotten mixed results, so I don't know, but I just need to, you to know that it isn't easy uh, to be a GM. And this is a whole nother level because you're adding Christianity to it, but it's not that hard. It really isn't. I, I just got to break that, that wall or that, that glass ceiling and get you to realize, Oh, it's not that bad. So I'm going to go through, um, the, this, this campaign and just get, get you to realize what it is that you need to do and how you can work it out with your kids. Um, and the first and most important thing is to get them to role play, you know, not fight, but to role play and realize, Oh, I, I got to respond to these pagans and their weirdness and their, their really bad notions of reality. Um, you know, so let me, uh, is this the one I want to use or do I want to be more closer upper? I'm gonna try this one for a little bit. Need to move this guy. So this is the, um, you know, the campaign book I'm, I've been working on. And it's based on some of the missions I've done, or, or, or adventures with, um, like the actors and the playtesting, and the legacy of Lugano. And Lugano is this region in Italy, um, with Lac du Lugano, which is the lake of Lugano Lake, Lake Lugano, or whatever. And then I've, I've, I've zeroed in on just this area, this sort of peninsula of the lake, this little, this branch of the lake where the, the adventurers start at Ravio and they go basically around to Lugano. And technically you, you, if you, if you familiar with the, this area, they could go in any direction they want. They could go straight, you know, maybe through Ravio into Lugano or to Porlezo or back or whatever. I should probably uh, move up Porlezo here, get a little more Porlezo in there. Do, 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 do. Um, but Porlezo is, is kind of where the main villain is the main, and they're not villains. They're the merchants who are 
running, basically they're running an illegal mine operation over here and enslaving the locals to run the mine, to get into the mines. And the horned ones are the cultists who are uh, controlling the people and enslaving their sons by getting them to sacrifice you know, their sons. So my the way I, you know, to make it PG, the way I created this story was, well, the pagan, what, what can pagans do that are not human sacrifice, sexualizing, you know, which is reality of, of paganism in, in history, um, in Christian church history. We need to realize that that's what we rub against. So what can I do to make it a little more PG, a little more not so intense with all that horrible uh, stuff that they did in the past and make it still bad. But, you know, if we're going to play this with family and kids. So the simplest thing is slavery. That's And, and slavery was obviously very common. Um, why not? As a pagan, why not enslave others? Remember, their definition of leadership is tyranny. Their definition of a leader is tyranny. The Christian definition of leader is service. So when we say the man is the leader of the household, they, uh, because their definition is he's a tyrant. The father, the husband is a tyrant. What a male chauvinistic worldview. Whereas our, the Christian definition is uh, he serves his wife and kids and gives up everything for them. That's the leader protects them, um, provides for them. And, you know, so two worldviews. So in this, in this, um, the pagans definition of leadership is to control is to take over people to, to use their children uh, in the minds and get them to believe that. So if they believe that they will, um, give up their children and, uh, and then they'll be protected by the horned ones. And the horned ones of course are, you know, basically extortion or whatever. So here's Ravio in my little doodly, um, map of the area. And What's going on in here? And I'm, I'm going to go through the basics of it and then run through the pages here. But what's going on is like, you know, they go to the village and they're going to see they're, they're giving up their sons to these the horned ones. And if they do not give them up to the horned ones, then, you know, they're going to, uh, the horned ones will come and attack them. Okay. So obviously the horned ones are people, you know, cosplaying as, as uh, with these antlers. And there's, and there's also an antler adventure where there's crazy deer. So you have, you have an opportunity here to give them, to have them fight a low level horned ones, which are just like kids in cosplay. Um, so thusly, they don't want to just kill them if they can help it. You know, they, they might have to, um, if the combat goes that way, but hopefully they'll be able to, you know, with the denouement rules, um, they'll, the, the, the kids will surrender and yes, kids, they're ki- literally kids being forced, conscripted into warriorship. And they have a ritual where they turn them that way because the ritual is, is drugs and, and, um, pushing and freaking them out and then turning them into warriors, like brainwashing them ritual of brainwashing. That's exactly what paganism is. Ritual, ritualized brainwashing. And that's something you, you want to get across to your, to other Christian men and to your kids, um, you know, in a PG way, uh, if you can. And, um, you could call the drugs potions, um, cause pagans use drugs all the freaking time. I mean, look at today. <laughs> There's, dr- they're pushing drugs on everyone. Pagans and the Democrat party. Yeah, I'm going there. I'm, this, this game is hardcore right wingish in a sense, but well, so is Christianity. If you come down to it, the Democrat party, I'm sorry. I, I've never, I used to be a Democrat by the way. So, but nothing in their history has ever been good. Anyway, uh, don't get me started. Uh, I just lost half of you, but whatever. Okay. So, um, this, so let me, let me, I'm doing a motorcycle out there. Big picture. Uh, ooh, yeah, let's get some crazy ones. Okay. Big picture of you. And, um, th- yes, there's a dragon. There's another dragon. See these dragons? Yeah, absolutely. We have dragons. There's this cool sorcerer in this, 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 uh, tomb crypt or, or whatever, Roman centurion immorte. There's a bestial borgs in this, uh, forest. There's a couple of witches over here, forest one and a, a marsh one. There's a undead evil spirits. And you know, I'm pretty sure most of you are comfortable with doing, pushing the, um, uh, some of the, uh, concepts of this into a more fantastical realm, you know, which, and I'm, and I, and I've, I've taken components of, of historical accounts from Christian missionaries, the fathers of the church and 
put mix them together to go ahead and do this because they have said they've they've seen spirits, they've seen ghosts, and they've seen evil spirits possess inanimate objects. And these are in the accounts of the historical documents of the of the church, beginning church forefathers, you know, and then throughout history. So I put two and two together, and so there's undead. They you know the the Romans uh, worship the undead, plus they use they set up guards, you know, fake guards, whatever. Um, and so I'm saying that the evil spirits will possess these and guard the tombs. And it's just a fun, dark adventure. Okay. So go with it, please. Cause everyone wants that. Everyone wants that. Oh, I should put a big rat here. Cause this is actually an adventure for rats. Let me do that real quick. Uh, let me see. Let me go into, see, look at all this. I'm working for you guys. Look at all the stuff I've got here. All right. Let me get the, um, ba, 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 ba. let me get the rats. Where's the rats? Where's the rats? I'm going to put a rat image in here. Let me see. Yeah, put a little swarm. Oops, I lost it. Ah, no! I hate when it does that. Just wanna, just wanna, I don't, just let me put a little rat pitch in there. There we go. Oops, why is it doing that? And move, oops, you don't see it, but it's coming right there. So there are rats in this story over here. And I had a dad email me about his story, which is really great. And he used rats and use the same concept here. Please take any of my ideas, go with it, add to it, extrapolate, um, make it fantastical. That's fine. As long as you are comfortable and enjoying, enjoying what, what kind of story you want to put together for your kids or your friends. And sounds good to me. And if you want to push the envelope as far as going into the fantastical, uh, that's fine. Um, you know, for this game, because, I don't know. I'm trying to kind of keep it reeled in for now um, because I want you and me to explore church history in medieval times um, and and keep sort of the challenges, you know, with, with, with some rubber bands, obviously, but with centralized into that medieval church dark ages history so that we can always go back to that for uh, research or get the kids encouraged so they want to go check it out and read it and read up on that stuff. Because I don't want us to get too fantastical that we just look for D look at monster manuals and D and D and other things for our re our adventure resources as opposed to looking at <clears throat> things we could we can glean from human nature, human history, pagan stuff. Um, anyway, so a little um, Bishop Gregory did a little dialogue here that you know is just an example of what you could do where they start off the mission um, where they're at the church and and the bishop talks to them and, and gets everyone together. And, um, you know, the, the basic concept too, of, of the warrior of the, basically the cleric would be the, the central, uh, character or leader character. You know, the Bishop would go to your cleric and say, we, we want you to go and, um, do this mission. And, you know, here's a, a knight or a holy warrior to guard you. And we have a patron lady who's going to finance this. And we really appreciate her joining. And of course we could bring a sister along a nun to, to support as well. So it's kind of like that's sort of the generalized, um, gathering of them. And it's going to be at the church where the Bishop gathers them all together into a room and they can all discuss it. And, and then he wants them to go out and, and investigate or, or, and plan churches, right? Go, go here, go there, wherever we are, <clears throat> see what's going on. And you kind of have that kind of mission startup, which is the simplest and quickest and, you know, for you to do. You, and obviously you can come up with any other thing, way of doing it as well. Or once they plant a church, a new um, minister could come into the church and tell them of their new mission, you know, that the bishop back home has brought for them. Like they have new information about a new area that they want to go check out. That's one way of doing another mission or starting a new campaign or, or another way is just for them to uh, hear about stuff. You know, look, if you, if you convert to locals, they're going to start telling you stuff about their neighboring towns and legends and, stuff, right? Stuff, stuff that they're afraid of that they've heard of. So that's another way you can just continue on with whatever storyline or, or campaign or the next campaign as opposed to having a tavern, but you can still do a tavern too. You can still have them start a tavern. Why not? That's, that's fine. But by me, I mean, it's up to you how adventurous and, uh, you want it to be now having non-believers in the game, like none, you know, I, I wouldn't start with that. I, I really wouldn't because for, for at least for, for beginning, but once you and your player, your Christian men players get really good at this and comfortable and really understand the game and love it. Cause you need to do that. Um, you can then start bringing in non-believers. I, I believe that's the next phase of this, of the for the Lord RPG. But right now 
for me personally, I'm focused on Christian men and women. If they, if they, if they, if they want to jump in, that'd be great. Um, but I'm focused on uh, Christian men so that we can figure this out. We can play test it. We can spend the next few years building this, understanding it, and you creating campaigns that you own. By the way, my game setting, the rules are, I can't trademark or copyright or whatever, right? They're game rules. So have at it. Take take my, um, I, I ask that you look at my belief system and are somewhat, cor- you know, yourself correlate close enough. Being the main thing of the of this game is is planning churches. Uh, not, you know, and the evangelism in this game is not necessarily converting them. It's just getting them to accept the planning of a church, you know, within the neighborhood, the town, the village. That's the main focus of this. It isn't necessarily evangelizing them in the sense of theology and accurate biblical theology. Um, but um, it's just about spreading the gospel and planning churches. And that's pretty much it. That's as far as you want. I want it to go as far as uh, the depth of this. So, you, so ergo, if you want to create campaigns and settings, you know, with lots of adventure, lots of pagan goofball crap, or I don't know if crap is a curse word or not, goofball stuff um you can um um do that and and um you know i would like just for you to always reference for lord rpg as the central hub of um where they could get the game rules from and then you create your own campaigns and sell them or promote them or whatever you want to do with it um i'm not going to come after you i'm one guy i don't care I, the more of you that do this um, as a as a ministry the more thrilled i am um and you can always take my game system and start, you know, create your own game system if you want. I don't care. I just, I'm done, you know, <laughs> I'm done. Um, but I'm here working hard on it and, um, you know, trying to make a, a good, good game system that's starts off easy, but then you can, it's very expandable out as far as like a long term, no limits to le- levels and all that. And yet the powers of the characters will stay sort of grounded that you, they'll always be afraid of just someone throwing a dagger at them, you know, uh, even when they're 20th level. So, um, okay. The, um, this one here, the forest path, and I'm not going to read it, but the basic premise of this is that this is, this is a good starting encounter, I think, because what it is is, and you can create whatever forest path you want, you know, it's whatever, and they're going to have a couple of traps here. Wolves. They're going to have like pet wolves that they'll have tied up or released in some area or, uh, in a bore in a gully where there is like a mud pit and it blocks the path. Um, and that, and the boar can come out and attack them. I've had players come up and fall into the pit because of the mud slide. I did like a mud trap where they just fall in pretty crazy stuff. And I mean, they roll a net one right here. You're falling in, you know, um, flies, the smell, but the, okay, so the concept is, is that this mother, she's kind of like a little minor witch. She, she uses her witchery to, you know, she's not like a witch witch. She's a pagan, whatever. She wants to be a witch, but she uses her power, what, what power she has, four magic points here, basically to keep her sons from, uh, from converting or being influenced by anyone but her. So if the, if the clerics try to, or the cleric or nun tries to, um, um, here, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the, what I wrote here long duress deliverance penalty for encamp- vile intimidation is what she does. Okay. Okay. I see what, what this is. So the, the duress is the save versus this. And then the deliverance is the, how much die. Uh, and it, it lasts for the, the entire encounter is what I put here. And see, I, you as a GM can make up stuff like this right on the spot. You don't have to go look at a list of, of spells for them to use. You can think about her. What is she doing? Okay. She's going to, she wants to, she's vile. She intimidates them. So she's probably swearing and, and you don't say the actual words. Like when, if you, if you role play her, you could just say, she says vile, disgusting stuff right in front of you, you know, makes you un, very nervous save. And she's putting in. A regular save is a 12, beat a 12. They'd have to use their spirit. Um, I would say spirit. They could use maybe their aggression because, you know, they're, but I wouldn't just say spirit. Just keep it simple. And, but she could add, uh, she has four magic points. So she can add a D4 to this. So let me roll that real quick. So I would, let's say she adds a, a, a D4 to this. 
one. So it's a 13 now, but she has three left. Does she, you know, I'm only going to spend one. So she spends one on them uh, at minus D4. So they're going to be a minus D4. Okay. And I, and I said for the encounter, so as long as they're around her, uh, if they don't resist that 13, uh, cur- you know, curse on them, they're going to be a minus D4 because there's, they don't like, they're uncomfortable around her, you know? And when they try to talk, she's like, bah, 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 you know, saying stuff. So she's doing a vile intimidation on them. So they got to save. Otherwise there'll be a minus D4. So she spent two of her magic points. She has two left. Uh, I'm going to say forces sons to do her bidding. I, you know, I didn't put anything there. Like, is it a, ma- well below. Okay. So, so yeah. So she's going to basically, she has two magic points left. She can roll a D4 or a D6. If she spends the two of them or D4, for one turn or D4 for another or D6 for whatever. But I want to say she does a D6 and she's saving it for when the players try to convert her kids, her sons, or when they try to use food or any or so, or, you know, whatever. And she's going to start blah, 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 blah. And, and then that D6 will go, I'm going to just make the D6 go on both her sons that they get to add that to their resistance to whatever the characters are trying to do to them. Okay. So that's what that is. And again, Lucy Goosey, you know, I'm playing with the die ranks here, the D4, D6, D8. That's what magic points refer to. One magic point is D4. The second magic point is a D6. Third is a D8, you know, D12, D10, D12. And again, the vile intimidation, it's the duress is the save. The deliverance is the, the amount of, uh, uh, you know, for the whatever role that it's for, which is penalty to the characters, um, to, um, resist it. And I would have done deluge, which is more accurate because deluge is how many you can affect, but I'm going to be a little mean here and say that this one just affects everybody because she's just talking out and, and spitting it out. So I'm just going to like, I'm going to give her that for free. You know, in this, this is her own special s- spell. Okay. You can do that. You, you can, use deluge as a rule that she has to follow or I, me, I'm just going to let her just, it affects everybody. Okay. So, so deluge is the other one. Deluge is important. Uh, um, duration. I did all D's by the way, duress, deliverance, duration, deluge. And I think there's another one. Distance. Distance is generally free. It's based on just how many magic points they spend or blessing faith points. Yes. It's, it's, you know, when Christians have faith and blessings and the pagans use magic, magic and drugs and, psychology and you know pageantry that's all their magic points um <clears throat> so um and by the way the four magic points how did i come up with that well she she has two because it's the average of whatever two traits i think she's going to be using plus she, she probably has uh, a d4 or whatever i just give her four you know just give them whatever you think but it should be pretty low it's for one encounter so she only said that's all she has after that, she can use skills like, uh, well, she's terrible at society, so she's not going to be very good at um, dealing with debating or arguing with anybody. She's very got a low spirit, so she could be converted herself. Um, she's a very stubborn person, though, so I'm going to, whatever, just, yeah, you know, I can come up with a stubborn skill or whatever. Whatever you feel like. Um, these guys have a spirit of minus two, so they, and a social of zero, so they could be easily persuaded as well but it's just a matter of rolling dice and and seeing if you can do it. So, but their whole goal is they want to get, when you come to the forest, they, um, they have a, this, this, this altar thing where you can put an offering down to pan the God, the, the forest spirit pan that will protect them through the forest, but you have to make an offering. See, so now there's a dilemma here. They, they're telling you, you must, and, the, and these guys are meant to be intimidating looking. They're not very tough. Only a vigor of nine, so they're, but they but they look big and tough. They're like young boys, like sixteen-year-old, overgrown or malnourished boys, whatever. Um, and probably the main, you know, like I'm being going into the weeds here, but the main success she's had is that she has one of her sons who just looks big and scary, even though he's just whatever. Um, well, he's kind of dangerous. He's a little aggressive, but anyway. So they, you have to put an offering on this altar, or if you don't, Pan, the spirit god, will be angry and will not. you will not get a safe passage through the forest on your way to Ravio. So we've just given the, the characters a dilemma. 
What do they do? Do they give it? And these guys should be intimidating. They look dangerous. What do the characters do? So let's just say, whatever, they don't give the offering and they go and they somehow get past these guys. And they, in the, in the story, uh, they use food and one, they just argued with her and then left. And she said, fine, you know, because he's, she's sent her sons off then to, to unleash these traps on them. I did the boar one first and I never actually got to the wolves, um, in most of the stories. So, but that's in there. And I even had it so that the wolves can be heard nearby in the forest. If they were to roll really good awareness and they, but they did. One of them did in one of the, 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 the games, but then they, they just ignored it. They just, well, we hear whimpering. So the wolves are tied up at that point. If they can find them ahead of time, they could realize that they're caught there and I don't know, release them or kill them. I don't know what, you know, I don't know what they're going to do. Um, but these wolves are meant to be released on them and hurt, hurt the players uh, by the, by the sons when they get there and release them and set their traps. So the trap is the wolf trap and then the boar trap being, and the boar trap is the boar is down in the mud just because that's where it is. But the, the the sons have laid out a tree, fallen tree, that they can't go along the road otherwise. Um, or they get near this gully. There's like a narrow path between the fallen tree and this gully. You know, whatever else you want to come up with. But simple stuff like this where they lure them or they they um, get these these things to go on them. And, of course, the brothers might even fight. But, again, the brothers would, would have a load. You know, they would have a very... Uh, their denouement would be a D six at the most. So they have a really good chance of surrendering or retreating. Um, cause a one through three, if I roll a one through three on the denouement, right, it's pretty much a surrender or flee. A four is backing off. A five is they're going to keep fighting, but we'll reroll a denouement next turn. You know, that kind of thing. A, six, a seven and eight is when they really want to fight. So most characters, you know, uh, initially will have a, a roll a D four or a D six. And then when they roll a D8 or D, D10 or D12, you know, there's a higher chance of them fighting to the death. So um, <clears throat> let me move on. So the area of Ravio to Perlazo. Um, so the main storyline is the merchants of Porlezo have, you know, like I said, created the mines and did all that. And they're running in that operation. Um, and this, oh, so this is the the Ravio. This is the, the little village where you're going to have the, you know, the, the, the Christians come in and see them, the villagers all set up and they're, they're, you know, and you can put, make it any little village you want with your little map or whatever. And they're, they're, they're a whole bunch of villagers and they're giving up their sons to the horned ones who go up to the mines up here. So this is like a, you know, long hill pathway up with you and you can do some encounters with, um, horned ones is an ambush or ban- or just bandits, whatever, or wolves. Give them, give them a little combat, a little fun combat. Um, then they got to cross this over, over this, uh, river ravine or whatever chasm dangerous. And there's a hidden pitfall here. So you can, you know, do a little fun trap thing there. I don't know if you can see that, um, that's always fun to do. And then you, then at the mines, I have the slaves working and they don't want to be bothered. They don't want to, you know, they're, they're slaves. They're doing their pagan slavery and, um, the Christians got to deal with that. They got to talk to them. There's even an altar out here, kind of a, a premonition of the altar to come. Um, and you can have some soldiers walking around guarding. They got to fight, try to release free the, um, and then here's a, just a mine down. And of course you're going to have the horned one, the final sort of demonic possessed, um, boss, or if you feel like they're still kind of new, you could just have a bunch of warriors. And then the, there's another place where you can have a final boss too. So it's up to you kind of how you, how far you want to take it. You could just have warriors here and then a sorcerer and they're just worshiping down here. Um, and then there's a boss further on kind of a thing. But again, the most important thing is to have an interaction in the village with the locals telling them this is wrong, you know, and the villagers, no, no, we want to be safe. And we want to, you know, we don't want you to Christians to rock the boat. You know, you got to really role play it up and ham it up. And, but we, but be whimsical too. Uh, have fun with it as a GM, you know, relax, relax into it. Um, and be dumb. Like a lot of times I won't know what to do, uh, you know, when they, and I, I just have the NP, you know, the characters, they, the, uh, the villagers they encountered not know what to do. It's 
fine too. Let the let them figure it out. Um, so this is the horned ones. There's the warriors. They're you know they're pretty low level as far as fighting, which is good. And then there's the the the, the one big tough one. He's gonna be like the ogre guy, and he's got some tough stuff happening here. Uh, and then the ancient horned one is a possessed human in the cosplay with you know oversized, but he's got some powers because he's drugged. He doesn't feel pain. Tied up in this thing, really messed up. Yeah, he's got some demonic, you know. There's a the save here is d6 and a d4, so that's crazy. That's the that's the unholy armor save. Um, plus a lot of fear kind of stuff going on here. So, in this one is the second part of the Ravio story, where you can have a, a fun little sort of random adventure through. And, you know, here's three mines they can go through, free the slaves, uh, clear out the mines of the horned ones, fight some um, antlered deer that are dangerous because they're all uh, fed by the witch, some poison. Some There's a witch in here somewhere that feeds them poison and makes them crazy. And then there's an altar area here where they do the ritual and turn the young slave men that they find strong enough into horned ones. You know, they... Do a whole ritual thing here. Very scary. There's also supposed to be a cave here. I probably have to read had this where that you can have a final uh, layer of a with a with the, you know you could do the final guy. This guy too there if you want. That's the final. The horned one part of this story is just in the, this this region of the. Let me go back up to this map. It's just this here. So the, all the horned one can, stories here. This is the the stone area. This is the mine area, and then this is the village. So you get sort of a, you know, different options. Then once they clear this up and plant the church and bring peace to the that village and convert them and get the church running here, then they are told by the church or who or by the locals about Aragno, Aragno, and it's and, it, and there was a church there and it's failing. See, so they so they moves over. So then they move over to Aragno, and then of course Aragno, they tell them about the Barrow Whites and the, the worship of the the tombs in, in the marshlands in the boglands. And then from there, they know that the, they'll be attacked by some horn additional horned ones or bandits from Parlezo who, who obviously are losing their mine operation and they're going to bring a counter force to, you know, of pagan warriors hired to, to eradicate the Christians. And, um, you know, so you, it's, I don't know. I, 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 I'm remembering back now of my adventure with this and it was a lot of fun. I just, I really do wish I, 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 I would have kept the group together to keep going on with the story and, and, and build it up. But it was all like when I play tested it, it was kind of with actors and then it was kind of meant to be a temporary thing. So I'm going to flesh this out even more and get the, get this uh, going more. Uh, here is the next town over where, and this one's a fun one. I really had fun role playing this one. That was, this one was such a blast. I, it's on uh, YouTube, but there is a church in this village of Aragno. No, no, this is not Aragno. This is what is this one called? Is this a Ragno? Yeah, a Ragno. It's it's a Ragno. I think it's a Ragno, not a Ragno. Because Rav, yeah, I keep Ravio is Ravio, and this is just a Ragno. I'm gonna change all these. I don't know where they're all. I'll try to remember that later. Okay. Um, so this village, and what's so these map pieces you can see here. See, you can use them over and over and over. You know, just have fun with it. And this is all provided for you. So you could put together your little thing. And I did this in Foundry and then I take a screenshot and then bring it in here. Um, found, you know, using the VTT uh, assets. But you can put this on a table or or just, <clears throat> or just doodle out what you want and then use my pieces. Or, <coughs> sorry, let me just pause real quick. Let me, let me clear my, blow my nose here a second. Okay. Okay. That's where I got my heater on, but I still feel a little chill here in Hollywood, California. All right. So what's going on in this one? My dog's barking. The other dogs. Okay. What's going on in this one is there's, um, let me zoom in for the fun of it. The church is infested with rats and the, the monk that's in there is so depressed because he's praying, blah, blah, blah. But the, the rats keep coming. And here is an underground, uh, ossuary or, you know, where there's some, some um, saints are laid to rest. Um, but it's all infested with rats. 
as you can see, this is the mines underneath the rat, underneath the church that he's not, he's unaware of. The villagers all know about this mine, but he, but the, he, the, the priest was never informed of this. And the priest is all alone, young, young sort of priest, uh, de depressed because no one's coming to church. They're all making fun of him. This merchant up here kind of runs the town and knows kind of the, the plot. He's a pagan, wants to get rid of the church or weaken it or just at least do what he, what's happening here so that everyone else will scoff at the church and then and he can run the, you know, the whole pagan plot. And the people are just unaware of that, They're, but they all think the church is stupid uh, because of the rat infestation. And they want him. So what's going on though, is there's a witch underneath here and she's got some warriors and you know, pagan warriors that know the plot too. So they're quite evil. So their denouement would be like a D eight, D six or D eight. They're going to be pretty high and they could fight to the death because they, they know what they're doing, you know, as far as pagans and what they're, they're countering the church. So they may fight to the death. Um, but again, each time you really hurt them, you can always do a new denouement roll because they're being wounded or if, if you rebuke them or whatever, but she's making, basically she's making a foul, whatever steroid drug that, that makes a giant mother rat and uh, down here in this pit, this hole. Uh, so the rat can't get out, but the rat can get out this way by sending the young little ones up into the church. So that's kind of the, the story. <laughs> And they got to figure all. They got to figure that all. Ah, they got to figure that all out. They got to find out what's going on. You know, the the townspeople are not going to help them. Um, <clears throat> they're going to ignore them. But uh, this guy is going to give him a hard time. And it was a fun little story they did. And there's a nice little underground adventure where they find this mine and go down there and check it out. And there's the scary mother rat, vigor of ten, Ooh. Uh, screech. All in short must save versus TR12 or take D4. So her screech literally gives you D4 damage. And the D4 damage obviously is is, is tires you out, you know, exhaustion, uh, unsettles you, weakens you. So that's kind of what but your vitality, which is your hit points, represents all of that. It represents hit points, it represents exhaustion, it represents just your frailty of uh, not wanting to deal with stuff. Um, so these are all the different options for rat stuff. And I... And I you know, I put in this little mix of different things. You could do a, a rat, rat pack, swarmer rats, <clears throat> kind of varying strengths of each one or getting stronger at each level. Uh, the brewing witch, she's, she's just her abilities. She's got like a ladle of searing brew. So she tosses that. So deluge D4, she can affect up to D4, uh, D6 burn. She just need, oh, you, and also you get a resistance of TR12. Or yeah, minus D fourth for the next turn because of hot the hot burningness of it. Uh, she but she just has to hit one person. If she hits one person, then the rest get it as well. Um, or you know, the rest in that area. That's kind of how I just simply do. Uh, if she can hit one person, you know, their, versus their defense, then roll a D four to see how many others she affects, and then they all just take D six burn every one of them. So you know, with the armor safe. Um, that's how I do that. Chill, cal cauldron of searing sewage. So she using a pole, she can leverage the cauldron to bowl over one target, TR10, to avoid cauldron. So TR, uh, so they got to beat a 10, not a 12, a 10 a little easier because it's slow and... <laughs> um, but... Um, uh, so you roll your aggression or awareness because aggression is how fast you can move and awareness is, you know, well, I see it's coming. I'm going to dodge it. Um... D8 damage, you get hit and knocked down. Deluge D6 of searing liquid. So it'll, it can fan out and sp just splash on everybody. Everyone has to roll a TR12 to avoid or take D6 damage. Okay, so it's kind of cool little. See, so that, see, I got my little fireball magic in this game. You know, you, I, you come up with creative ways to do stuff for each character, each witch or whatever. And you're free to do stuff like this all the time. It's all about just resisting, you know, roll, roll, a, roll a resistance roll. Or take damage, you know, roll a resist roll or take a minus D4 for that. And, you know, until you can wipe it off, you know, the, and, the, and the duration again, I, 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 I'm loosey goosey with duration of things. It's really just when they can get a moment to get out of it. You know, if they get stunned, you're at minus D4 um, until you can shake out of it. You know, I spent a turn getting out of, you know what I mean? It's, it's that kind of duration. I don't like, I, I avoid, generally speaking, I avoid like, you know, D six turns or D four turns or whatever you could do that. And I certainly have it in some instances, especially if, um, especially if they do a bless and they want to add a duration to it that then you use turns. 
Um, but stuff like where you are affected and, you know, searing liquid, it's burning you. It'll last for one turn. So I'll just say the next turn. Um, but maybe it's an acid. You have to wipe it off. Now that's going to keep burning you until you stop and wipe it off. So that's the, how I do duration generally. Repel. She uses this to avoid being hit. She hisses and spits, spittles profusely. So she has some magic points here. Where did I put any? Ugh. I did not put any. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, and, and and again, I haven't polished this up yet. So spirit of six, uh, that's an older version. So I'm going to give her a spirit of three, an intelligence of three. So her magic points is going to be, uh, magic points is three. I'm going to give her a plus D four. So she has a few magic points. Um, to use on all she has is repel because the rest of it is ritual. So as in she creates the concoction with her magic points. <clears throat> oh, she has a foul stench. So if you, when you come near her, you auto automatically have to reverse, reverse or I would say that room has a foul stench. Uh, first attack takes a maneuver for her to reload. Oh, the ladle of searing. I think first attack for the ladle. Or later, because she's it's 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 there ready. She just splashes it out, but she takes a maneuver for her to reload. So she she has to stand by it the whole time to keep tossing it out or whatever. But her magic points really is just for the repel. Um, so she for repel mainly. For, I'm just gonna put that down as my note mainly, you know, just because um, mainly in combat. Because the rest of it is not magical. It's just her doing it. But the repel is she just freaks you out and hisses and spittles for you. So she can spend a lot on... So basically, it, it gives you a, a, a penalty uh, to hit her. You know? And she's pretty weak. Vigorous 7, which is actually kind of tough for um, a, a, a witch. Uh, okay. And uh, most of my witches, too, are generally easy to kill. They, you know... You get, but you got to get past their um, their guards. I don't have her guards on here, so let me make sure I make a note of that. I'm gonna put down her, you know, the the beastmen guards, uh, beast men guards, uh, goons or whatever goons guards. And here, okay. Oh, you can't see. Oh no! Don't tell me you haven't been able to see this the whole time. Great. Uh, epoxy on me. Darn it. Sorry about that. That's what this all is right here. Anyway, okay. Um, This is the local merchant, Sevacor. And I rolled that. It's kind of a cool name. I rolled that, you know, on the on the chart. You just intimidate, you know, basic stuff. He has a few locals as muscle. All right, make sure. What is this one here? The Barrel Whites. Okay, so this is this here. And... This is in the marshes, in the water, so they got to take a boat out to these. I had a lot of fun role-playing these ones. And this was kind of like my D&D, you know, part of this. And these are all hidden, right? You 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 hide these until they they, they come to this little island with this this um, hole, whatever it's called. It's a stairway going down. It's all wet and swampy, and in there is a tomb, and the barrel, you know, could be very, you know, I did giant spiders. You could do giant snake. You could do whatever you want. You know, within a sort of medieval prehistoric type creatures, uh, there's a hidden pit trap right there. Um, and definitely barrel uh, undead. I, you know, the um, the priest in this one, the cleric, ended up using fire to defeat the, the undead. But And I let him, which is fine. Fire is fine. I think, though, I definitely... Fighting undead is going to be hard, and you got to use glory for the paladin. The holy warrior uses glory to, to negate any undead armor saves. They get regular armor saves, but they don't get their undead armor save. Because glory is basically doing extra damage, which is a rare thing, because most damage is just, just, just the die roll. So glory is the one time that I can think of where you can actually add a second holy damage die roll to the damage. So a knight is really needed against um, the undead. The other thing is the clerics, if they have, um, I think it's exorcism. Let me look at the rule, the spells here. So there is a limit, like, you know, you don't want them to go up against the undead unless they, uh, evil spirits, unless they ha are prepared. They really have. So glory, 
over here for the combat damage uh, will will negate. Um, this gives one a blessed die for combat damage rolls and can be used after a hit is known. Can use duration, but counts down even if one misses. <gasps> I don't have negates holy. One's well done. One's weapon is given the holy effect. It cancels unholy armor saves for the duration. Getting a special weapon or having one blessed by a great saint could bring about the faith to gain this blessing. Okay, I have it in there. Not under glory. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's my rules too. All right. Uh, there you go. So it's under, so, well, glory, if nothing else, then we'll add an extra die damage, which could overcome that. There. Okay. There's that. All right. Well, look, something. And now I learned something. Wow. Um, let's go to clergy. Let's see. Exorcism. Holy vigor drain. This removes vigor from an unholy and possessed, harming the demonic and evil spirits. They get no armor or dark protections. They can they can resist for dire villains only. So they can resist, but if you do succeed, they will drain their vigor. And yeah, the unholy. So that's the the one you need for uh, exorcism for the undead and evil spirits. Is exorcism. What about uh, no? The nun doesn't have anything. I don't believe against them, except I see an angel. She can do that. And you should always try to encourage the, the nun players to. I see an angel should do only do that during epic finales and not just willy nilly, you know? Um, so holy weapon is very cool. And, but it's specific to undead mainly or, or demonic, demonic possessed. Anything that's demonic possessed or undead, you will give them a second. Generally speaking in my creature listings, you'll give them a second dive to the armor save, which really, really makes them hard then to kill. Thusly, a holy weapon is really important for that, and exorcism is really important for that. And the uh, the character should not go up against those until they get the experience to get holy weapon and exorcism you know, as part of their. Um, or if they do encounter one, it's just, it's just going to be a really hard fight, you know, because it's going to be a slog, um, and they should maybe retreat. And that's the way it's meant to be. It's supposed to be like that, you know. Okay. Uh, so this one's kind of cool, you know, they different, you know, you can do whatever you want in here. I mean, I, I, I have some options here, treasure list. Um, I put down in here for, so what does treasure look like in this game? All right, let's, 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 let's take a look. Trinkets of old plus D4 to trade for common items. You know, so that's, you know, okay. Artifacts of the Romans finance for a church. See? So, so if you give those artifacts to the church, you will get a glory point because you're financing the church time you sort of support the church uh you know role play that out too uh spear of centurion sevilla plus d4 to hit so it's a spear armor and it's just well made arm and it can damage be damaged and broken armor of pro Consul indinio brigadine d10 great helm will cost a tr14 smithing and or trade skill to fit properly and i don't yeah you, you got to get that someone to fix it for you uh, it's a brig that's D10. That's it. There's no magic to it, I guess. Uh, sack of golden treasures, D12 to any trade of value. So that's a big... Oh, this will add D12 to any trade of value. But I've taken out that rule, actually. Um, so uh, I, I I don't know what to say about this. Like what, 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 how much that would be. Uh, I got to think about this. Let me... I'm going to put that in red so that I remember to think about like what, how much, what would this really be um, in the game? Reinterpret that. Tome of history plus D4 to Roman history. So if they read this, they get a Roman history plus D4. Or, um, or if you already have Roman history, this plus D4 will add to that. So let's say you have Roman history plus D4, and this will make it a plus D6. Okay. So that's what that refers to. The script traps, you know, I just did a couple of, different options there. Um, this is what it looks like without, you know, until they, until they can get it, get over to these areas and look around, um, in the water, they won't see the ruins yet until they get closer. It's foggy, misty. They, they, they can camp right here. I could have, um, I did have a couple encounters here as well. The old gladiator. That's one Let me move over there. The old gladiator is, uh, and this is a really cool story concept. I did it in the game and in the play test. Really awesome, fun. So this is a really amazing fighter. He goes and he's hunting Christians because he hates them because they ended the gladiators in the glory of Rome. You know, the glory of Rome. And when I killed the other 
slaves and warriors and, and the and the crowds cheered for me. See, that's a whole pagan thing right there. And the Christians are like, that was wrong. And, and the, who stopped it? The Christians. And he's angry. So he's attacking Christians because um, they ended the, the, the gladiators. And um, so they have a big fight. Now what happens is they, they fought him and they nearly killed him. And it was, it was hilarious because they actually, in the one that, where they fought him, they, he totally fumbled and they totally got him. He, he cut himself. <laughs> the gladiator did. It was hilarious. Um, but then they healed him. And because they healed him, he, he his heart was turned and became a Christian and he protected their church. And so that was cool because it made that church never fail. No one's going to mess with that church because his gladiator was there. But um, that was a great, I really, you know, that was a great moment. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to have that great of a moment, but you know what? You have so many opportunities to convert people in this game, and, and each one of them is like a great moment in the game. Um, now, maybe, you know, the gladiator is going to kill them all. And you know what? That could happen, and you all should be comfortable with that in the sense of, you know, Christians died um, for their faith, and then if they all die, then make new characters. Um, and it's not that hard to make new characters. and Start again, and maybe have the new ones go on this path and find this gladiator and... You know, I guess they could be angry and do revenge or they could be angry, you know, or be of Christ and forgive him and save him maybe. So see this game for the Lord RPG gives you and the players an opportunity to, to, to live through this in a fun, whimsical way, but also work on your evangelism and work on your peace and your forgiveness and all that. So he does come and encounter them here, but you can have him, you know, at any point uh, encounter them. Um, and even some, um, I even had some, some horned ones come and uh, attack them here. Uh, cause they, cause the Porlezo merchants are trying to bring some la- leftover horned ones, you know, gathered up whoever was left to go and attack them. Okay. Let's move on. Oh, oh, I have here undead cursed Roman soldier. Mysterious tent. Oh, so that this is all for the mines. Demonic evil spirit, undead. I mean the uh, barrow, barrow, the the marsh thing. The cursed Roman mummy here. Um, you know, in the mine or in the swamp area, and just different things. You know that they have t- uh, toughness and drain glare. So he, he the, the mummy will stare at them. And you know, tr twelve trial rating of twelve, resist or lose d four aggression until one rests well. See, that's kind of cool and you know again i just made it up right on the spot just what can i do to make this thing creepy and and do something um poor lazo so the merchants of the mines. so this is i got some names here of people that you can use who they worship the and so for me the campaign is the sorcerers of bacchus because bacchus is their freaking wine you know lustful pagan god and the witches of magni and this is uh, like Greek, Magni or whatever, I think, or Germanic, Germanic or whatever. I can't remember. The sorcerers of Bacchus and the witches of Magni are the like force um, conspirators who are trying to stop the church from spreading up, you know, and, and then retake Rome for the, for the, for Bacchus. So, so they're on the move, the pagans, you know, in my little campaign here that I really would love to keep, keep move, um, GMing, I'm trying to get a group together on Wednesday nights. But um, anyway, so this is, um, uh, this is the Porlezo and it's at the end of that lake and, um, they worship a dragon in the water, the lagoon dragon. And, uh, <clears throat> and we, I, and I, if there's a, a play test, it's a video on there, uh, the very finale of the, um, of the, the dark ages series where the, the characters come out and deal with this and, and the people all worship it and they feed it and, you know, it comes and I got little different little tokens here for, as it comes out of the water and, had a great fight here with this dragon and <clears throat> it was a lot of fun. And when, once they defeated it and it flopped on the beach, they um, showed that it was not a God and the people were like, what? And anyway, so this, anyway, it's just a fun little, and then they had to deal with the locals and, um, you know, you just, you as a GM, just, you just, you have them all, these little locals and, and they all have one or two motives that they want to do. And that's it. Keep it simple. And, um, you know, maybe one's just for profit. One's just, you know, wants to use the dragon to control the people. And once it's dead, like, Oh, what do I do now? I don't know what to do. You know, here, here's a church. Oh, let's, let's do a church thing. Um, it's just a lot of fun. And, um, back here underneath the church is an old, um, tomb 
So I think I have a little adventure back there. And the old tomb is right here, and it's got a, a giant serpent slumbers here, and an evil spirit lurks here. And back here is St. Siphonius. So if they find St. Siphonius, they get a cool holy mace or something. Um, and that's underneath the church. And the pagans have, um, you know, put the serpent there to try to keep anyone from going and finding St. Siphonius. They kind of hit him away and feed a giant serpent. Uh, Dra Draconis Serpentis, an evil spirit. See? I do all kinds of fun stuff. And, I, you know, I haven't finished this up yet. So, um, and then this is Logano. We're the main town, and they've got a couple of fun adventures in this one. I mean, you know, I'm going to zoom this out because uh, I'm kind of going to finish it up here. So this is Logano. It's got some, there's a forest adventures, and this is kind of like low level again. They can start up, you can even start them here, you know. The tomb in the forest, a kind of a bunch of different little adventures they can go searching around, and, and you as a GM can kind of place these wherever you feel like, you know, if you want to have them explore, you know, whatever map you want to make on the table. Um, or, you know, on a VTT, a virtual tabletop and online, um, just different options here. And I'm, I'm making a list. So this is a cool little adventure here. And as they see a troll, I made a troll, some crazy giant dude, crazed lurking in the tombs, um, undead soldiers, uh, sp giant spider back here, you know, got him some cool stuff here. Uh, what else? This is the marshes. So then in the marshes, and this is on the other side of, of Lugano, uh, the people will, they will feed, uh, give, give, um, offerings to the witch for her to protect them in the marshes. So what she does is she's feeding this crocodile. That was like a pet of a Roman, you know, leader in the day or whatever. It's a giant crocodile living here now. And, uh, she feeds it. And if they don't give her offerings, she will lure, she will use food and drugs to lure it over to curse them, you know, hunt them. And, and so they give her offerings because they, if they don't, this evil dragon will attack. See, see stuff like that. Um, and then the finale is sorcerer Jamba, 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 whatever. And he has a centurion, this big dude, this big freaking demonic looking, you know, overgrown giant dude. That's, you know, that kind of thing. And they live up in the mountains um, near Lugano. They, they were here, Mount Bellino. And this is Lugano. What, what am I doing Mount Bellino here? I'm confused by what am I doing here. I'll read it later, but uh, this is kind of strange. It's supposed to be here. I don't know what this one is. Um, I, I have another one for this one, so I don't know what's going on here. But anyway, Mount Bellino is here. Um, and it was a really cool adventure. They go in through here. They could find this mine and go in through here, but there's a, like a, I put it like a saber tooth or, a, you know, oh, here's a lion. Up here, uh, there's a trap, which they avoided here. Oop, what did I just do? But the basic premise of this is that the sorcerer is, um, and he's got a little lab back here. He's making, he was, he, uh, I don't know, I have to read the backstory on it, but he, he's trying, he's got fireball. See, he's got a fireball. He's, he's like a chemist. Uh, repulse, spark, smoke, theatrics. That's what he uses. He's got serious magic points. Boy, I made his magic points way too high. Let me bring that down. Uh, four or five. So he's going to have four. Oops. Oh, I'm going to talk to my financial advisors here in a sec. So I need to stop this. Okay. So he's got, he's going to command his lion to guard him to attack. Um, so he's got some stuff here, right? Yeah. And, um, but his goal is to bring back the glory of Rome for the glory of Rome. Whoa, is art, beauty, revelry. Your monasteries take over the bathhouses. Your churches take over the amphitheaters. You have ruined the beauty and pageantry of Rome. I think I'm doing like an English actor here. The sorcerers of Bacchus will undermine you with every step. No, that's a vampire. And take back our glory. Let me see Italian. Yeah, Italian, Italian, I know. Italian, we shall throw you all in the arena for our entertainment. Let us get a feel for that now. Okay, so this guy wants to bring back the glory of Rome, like the gladiator, and the, and the sword, you know, of the bar, uh, the glory of Bacchus, and the and the lust and art and beauty and revelry. Um, so that's what his whole goal is in this area, and he's been the one financing all the you know, the merchants of Palazzo and and maybe the witches in um, the witches in um, Lugano. Um, so he's the source of this mini campaign. Um, 
with his riches in, the, in there. So if they defeat him and get the riches, uh, they get a bunch of glory points and they get to finance the church over here in Lugano. Okay. So that's like a little mini campaign in this area. And that's all I've developed. I really need to, I really want to work on more of this, but I've been doing the Christians in space one and the apocalypse and trying to finalize the first edition of this game. And then I want to work on some other editions of the game. And I don't have now a, and what really gets me to create campaigns is by role playing, you know, GMing them out. That's when I get excited to do this or focus on it, you know, whereas I'm now sort of focused on Christians in space. Um, but yeah, I'm really hoping to get a group group together to, to role play this out. And um, so that I can make more of these because there's a whole world, you know, bigger region. Let me see. I have it over here. Um, right, right here. So I want to expand out to the, all this other stuff here, you know, and, and just really develop um, the dragons and the, the, the powerful sorcerers of Bacchus. So oh, this is the source. Of, this is the main sorcerers of Bacchus. And the witches of Magni are over here controlling this Germanic kind of area with werewolves and vampires, bloodsuckers and giants and um, uh, troglodytes in the swamp, which is the Huns. I kind of like bringing back the Huns. Uh, Germanic demon, demon, Germanic demon, demon temple here, you know. Um, so you can do all kinds of fun stuff. Dragons, which is dinosaurs, you know, because we, we, cre- we believe in dragons. Uh, so I'm, you know, this is just giving you ideas on. I need to end this. This is giving you guys ideas uh, on the Dark Ages setting and and kind of doing that amalgam of history and myth and Christianity and church history and paganism of medieval Europe. The real fantasy. The real fantasy. Fantasy to me is real and it should be to you because it is. It's 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 our storytelling. It's it's our our fellowship. It's our edification. It's it's our psyche. It's who we are. So when people scoff and say fantasy is just fantasy, yet they what they mean is we don't want your Christian faith. We're going to go ahead and push our paganism on you. If you want to join our, in our game. So, you know, please, please realize you have got to bring your faith into the game. Fantasy or not. I don't care. Don't care if it's fantasy, you know, it, and they say, Oh, it's just fantasy. Oh, okay. Well, isn't Christianity fantasy to you? Okay. Well, I want, I'm playing a Christian. I'm going to spread the gospel in your, you know, your forgotten realms world or whatever the hell I'm playing. It's fantasy, right? Let's do it. Fantasy. Don't care. Okay. That's my, my clarion call to you, Christian men. So in the game of life, and I hope this is helpful in the game of life, roll holy dice.